Good to see everyone this morning. We appreciate you being here. If you're visiting with us, we hope you'll just take a moment after service to give us an opportunity to meet you and let you know how much we appreciate you being here. If you're joining us online, we want you to know we appreciate that as well. As we begin this morning, I'd like to read something and share something with you. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. Fight the good fight along with all believers. Take hold of eternal life. You were chosen for it when you were openly told others you, what you believe. Many witnesses heard you. God gives life to everything. Christ Jesus told the truth when he was a witness in front of Pontius Pilate. In the sight of God and Christ, I give you a command. Obey it until all our Lord Jesus appears. Obey it completely, then no one will find fault with you. God tells us to fight the good fight. Fight in the face of terminal illness. Fight in the face of death of loved ones. Fight in the face of financial issues within our lives. And fight in face of marital issues. Always remember that Jesus Christ and our Father God are the rock we put our faith in whenever we face life's trials like those just mentioned. Reach out to them in those times of need. Also, remember to reach out to your family here at Snellville to find love, solace, and support. Another way to do this is through our small groups. Not only do you have an opportunity to further discuss the weekly lesson but you have an opportunity to get to know your brothers and sisters in a deeper and more meaningful way. By sharing our lives with one another, it gives us a chance to serve one another each week. Please consider small groups if you are not participating in them. We all need these connections. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being our rock, for being where we can, our refuge in times of need. We pray that you would be with us now as we enter this worship service and be with us throughout it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If it's convenient for you, we'll stand for our first two songs. You are beautiful beyond description to marvelous for words to wonderful for comprehension like nothing ever seen or heard who can grasp your infinite wisdom who can fathom the depths of your love you are beautiful beyond description majesty enthroned above and i stand i stand in all of you i stand i stand in all of you holy god to all praise is due. I stand in awe of you. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords who is the great I am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise. 
praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Please be seated. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory, revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, who has bought us and sought us and guided our ways. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again, revive us again, fill each heart with thy love, may each soul be rekindled with fire from above, hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, Thine the glory, revive us again. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day you've blessed us with and given us another opportunity to come worship you this morning. I pray that we take the lesson that we're taught today and apply it to everyday lives. Um, I pray that you be with the leaders of this church, leaders of this country, help them make the right decision, um, the right Christian decision to keep um, our best interests at heart. Be with the people that are sick and in the hospital, the ones we have listed. Um, be with the doctors caring for them. Help them, heal them, if it be your will. Most importantly, thank you for your son, the sacrifice he paid. It's in his name we pray. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, 
Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. All right, thank you, Tom. Hope you brought your Bible with you this morning. You can turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 13, as we study a parable, a very short parable this morning, it is called the parable of the dragnet. I love the study of the parables, but rarely do you hear a study or a sermon on the parable of the dragnet, and yet it's such a powerful, such a personal lesson. Speaking of wonderful lessons, we had a great Bible class, another great Bible class this morning. We're talking about living like Jesus, and Tom Cutter spoke on living humbly this morning. Just a wonderful lesson, and so thank you, Tom, for that good lesson, and Thank you for all those that came. We're gaining a little bit more, a little bit more every week, and uh, we want to encourage you to come. Where there's so few of us, you can spread out as much as you want to spread out. Um, and uh, if you want to lay down in the chairs, so you be more comfortable. And uh, however you want to do it, uh, you're, you're missing some really good, wonderful lessons. So if you can, just uh, come and be a, be a part of that, uh, those classes as, as well. I had a great week this week. It was a busy week, but uh, I told my Wednesday night Bible class that uh, we we're going to surprise my mom for her 87th birthday. She turned 87 years old on on a Thursday. She's born on tax day, April the 15th, and uh, so uh, she did not know uh, we were coming. In fact, she thought that no, none of the kids are my brother, my oldest brother. Uh, was going to be there anyway. He was going to help her, uh, he said, with her taxes and, and take, her to, take her to lunch or they were going to order lunch. And she had no idea that my sisters, my two sisters had taken the day off. Kay and I flew down uh, to uh, West Palm and uh, we surprised her for lunch. And when my sisters walked in, she, she just threw her arms up in the air and said, oh, this is, I'm so happy. But then when we walked in, she started crying. And it's a reaction that I get a lot when I show up at places. And uh, so uh, she, uh, we got to see her, of course, on her birthday. And then the next day we ate breakfast together and then, uh, and then flew back. Um, you know, family special. And uh, we, love, we love our moms, uh, we love our family. And, um, but you know what, uh, church family is special. And I think one of the things when I was 15 days in the hospital that I missed, other than Kay and the kids, um, I missed worship. I missed meeting around the table. I missed being together with my church family like I had never missed before. And, um, and I think we, we so, many uh, so many times take these opportunities for granted, and, and I don't want to ever do that uh, again. So let's study together. We're glad that you're, if you joined us online, you're, you're at home. Uh, well, I hope you get your Bible and you can follow along. You're in the mask room next door in the fellowship hall. I hope you're following along as well, and I hope all of your families are doing so well. Jesus taught this parable in Matthew 13 and verse 47 and following. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it's filled, they drew it up uh, on the beach and they sat down and they gathered the good fish into containers and the bad they threw away. And so it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and they will cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said, have you understood all of these things? The disciples said, yes. Jesus didn't argue with them. We're assuming that he knows their heart and their mind, their life. And so he says to them, and it's interesting, verse 52, Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household who brings forth out of his treasure things new and things old. So uh, the dragnet is, of course, uh, would be familiar to the people of this time. 
uh, mo like most parables, uh, they were examples, stories from what was taking place. In fact, remember, it, it, you can look this up for yourself. Look at the beginning of Matthew 13. Where is Jesus when he tells these stories? Tell me where he is. Matthew 13, verse 1 and following. Where is Jesus when he tells these stories? He's in a boat. He's in a boat. He's on a seashore, and he's on a boat. They pushed out from shore, and he is literally uh, has people probably all around him with fishing nets. Um, he's in a boat. He's sitting down. He is teaching uh, all of these uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, lessons. And so these are familiar stories. He uses familiar things, speaking these word pictures so that they might understand. They are mysteries being revealed, and it really the story itself is not a mystery. What Jesus does is he uses truth alongside this parable or this story. Uh, the same two people could, in the audience, two people could listen to this story, and one go, oh, I know what he's saying, and the other one go, I don't know what he's talking about. But the disciples had a little bit of uh, privilege in that they would go away with Jesus and quietly he would explain to them some of these parables where he would not explain some of these parables to the great multitudes or the crowds. Some got it, some didn't. But he would use these uh, stories to lay truth alongside and teach these stories. And really what these stories did uh, for the most part is revealed the heart of the listener. If you were ready to hear something, if you were ready for the kingdom, if you were ready to hear uh, the truth about what was coming in the kingdom, then you would be ready to hear and understand this parable. Also, the kingdom of heaven is used something like 32 times in uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew uses the phrase over and over and over. And so I want to give you a cliff note, kind of a simple version of understanding this idea of the kingdom of heaven or sometimes interchangeably with the kingdom of God. In the Jewish mindset, the rule of heaven would involve the coming of the Messiah, and he would rule politically, he would rule militarily or powerfully by way of conquering the Romans. He would crush the Romans, and he would establish an earthly throne in his coming. But Jesus would show by his teachings, and especially in his parables, that that wasn't the case. The Messiah at the first coming, would he would, he would reign, he would rule, but he would rule and reign in the hearts of men. The kingdom would be established on this earth, but there would be a culmination of all of that when Jesus would return. So they didn't understand, especially as they see a Messiah, a Christ coming, he is coming now as the sacrificial lamb with selfless love to die for the sins of all of mankind. The Lion of Judah would be the Lamb of God. And so his first coming and the birth, and you'll, we know the story of the birth of Jesus there in Bethlehem so long ago, we would understand that Jesus would come to rule, but he would rule in the hearts of men and women, and uh, John the Baptist would be the forerunner of that message of his coming, and then there would be some privilege that would see the signs and hear uh, see the miracles and hear the wonderful words of Jesus and all of these mysteries would be revealed. And so the kingdom of heaven is a present day reality and that is we can be a part of the kingdom. Um, we can have Jesus ruling in our hearts. We can have him ruling in our lives. He is the rule. And one day when he uh, comes back for us, we'll be with him in heaven for all eternity. What a wonderful day uh, that will be. But so one day, so part of it speaks of what's happening today, and part of this speaks about what's going to happen at a later time. The kingdom of heaven to the listeners that Jesus was speaking to would mean to them something else as they thought about a Messiah coming as a conquering king. Yet Jesus was speaking to them, yet one day I am going to come as a conquering king when I return. The parable of the dragnet is a story about fishing. Everybody loves a good fishing story, except a wife who has a husband that fishes a lot. She probably doesn't care about hearing another fishing story. My favorite fishing story that I have to tell, I can't tell anybody else's, when I was a little boy, my grandfather took us out on the Lake Worth Pier, 
and there were some young men fishing on the Lake Worth Pier, and uh, they took a Kobe, they caught a Kobe, which is a very large fish, and they cut his head off. And you can imagine, as a little kid, I just thought that was the coolest thing. And they gaffed this head of this Kobe, and they put a balloon on it, and they threw it back out in the water. And what they were fishing for was a shark, but there is no shark fishing on the pier. And sure enough, these guys uh, caught a hammerhead shark. And I can remember as a little kid, um, that shark being pulled toward the pier and the pier master being so mad. And my grandfather was just smiling. He said, wait, he's, he's mad, he's coming. My grandfather, he couldn't wait for a good fight, you know. And the pier master w told these guys, listen, you can hold that shark out of the water for two hours or you can go down there and you can cut that line. Uh, as a kid, I didn't realize that they had pulled a shark to shore and there were swimmers 25 feet away. So they had already pulled all the swimmers out of the water because they caught a shark. Fishing normally is like that. We think of fishing with a line and a hook and a sinker, maybe not on that scale. But that's how we normally think of fishing. But in Jesus' day, even though they did fish like that, Normally, they fished with nets. Uh, in fact, they would use a single net, and they would cast it into the sea. They would wade out into shallow water, and they would, they would see fish uh, swimming nearby, and they would cast that small net. In, in fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 4, remember when Jesus calls the fishermen to become fishers of men? It's in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 4, Peter is actually fishing with this kind of net. Peter and his brother are probably taking turns. It says they are casting a net into the sea, and they are taking turns using this kind of net. It had weights around it. It had a cord on it, and they would throw it across the fish. It would sink down, and they would pull the cord. And so as the cord was pulled, the net would wrap around the fish. But there was even a larger kind of net. It was called a drag net. And they would take this net, usually it took a team of people to do this, a couple of boats were involved, but they would take this net and they would pull it out into the sea. A couple of men would stay on the seashore and the boats would drop this net into the sea. The weights would sink the bottom part of the net all the way down to the seabed and the flotation devices would stay on top of the water. And what it would do, it would create this giant wall, this massive wall of a net. And the people on shore would pull this net after the boats had taken this net far off the shore, they would pull that net toward them. And it would take everything, and I mean everything in its path. It was uh, not discriminating against what it would take. The, the net, this giant drag net would be pulled in and this massive wall would take whatever fish, whatever garbage, whatever seaweed, whatever was in its path, whatever it would catch, it would draw it in. And as it pulled it in, they would get it on shore. And of course, the juice would take the, whatever was found. And there was some fish that they could eat, some fish that they wouldn't eat. And they would separate those fish on the shore, the good from the bad. That is the three kinds of fishing that were used in the Middle East. And normally, we're, we're not used to this idea of a dragnet, but that is the picture in Matthew chapter 13. It is the picture of the dragnet. It follows, if you'll look at your Bible, it follows immediately after the parable of the treasure and the parable of the pearl of great price. And those parables are reminding us, remember, that there are some things that are so valuable, they're so worth selling everything giving everything up, and it speaks of the value of the kingdom. And it also speaks about the value of redemption. God gave, he paid a great price for you and for me. And there is this great price that has been paid for us. So there's not only the value of the kingdom, the value of redemption, there's the value of all of these things. But because of redemption, there is going to be in the end a calling, a separating. That's the idea here in, after the net is drawn in, from the good fish and the bad fish. It is an idea, it is a picture that's used over and over in the New Testament. So real quick, I wanna just give you just some things, some lessons that we can learn from the parable of the dragnet. What is it that Jesus was trying to tell this crowd 
what is it that he would want you to know, me to know today? So first of all, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. That the net is being drawn and every day, and by the way, my heart breaks to say that every day around 150,000 people around the world die. 150,000, uh, uh, the average I think is something like 147, thousand people every day the net every day is being drawn in the bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment and so he is reminding us that no one avoids judgment the net is being drawn in remember indiscriminately of anything in its path and as it pulls in it pulls in every kinds of fish all that is in its uh, path and that one day judgment will come the Apostle Paul, when he talked about judgment, uh, he said we ought to use it for a good thing, and that is to persuade men. I want to read to you. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 5 and following. Paul said, but now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore also we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men but we also made manifest to God, I hope that we have made manifest also in your consciences. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you as an occasion to be proud for us that you may have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. He also goes on to talk about us being ambassadors of Christ. But Paul said that we, knowing that the, the fear of the Lord, that there is a judgment coming, we persuade men. Paul said, this is my ambition. I want to be with the Lord, but I also want to take as many people with me as I possibly can. I want to teach a gospel message, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And as that net is drawn, I want as many people as I possibly know to hear the incredible message. It's because of the fear of the Lord that we persuade men. And so it's his love that motivates us, certainly, um, and it's his love that uh, saves us. And so uh, that's the first thing I just want to tell you about. No one will avoid judgment. It is a fact, something that many times we don't talk about, but I think that we, we know a time, a day of reckoning is coming. Have you ever done something and you know, oh, I wonder if I got caught? You don't have to raise your hand, it's okay. Uh, oh, a while back, we all went to Florida just for about five days and we got the whole family together. And it was the, the kids, our grandkids, we just got everybody together. We just had a great time for five days. And in that five days, Kay said, hey, listen, I want to go get our moms and bring them to meet their great-grandchildren. And so we went and picked up my mom and picked up her mom, and we drove them to where we were in Dania, Florida, and they met, they'd seen pictures, but they met, some of them for the first time, their great-grandchildren, and they got to see their grandchildren again. It was a happy time. And I tell you that story because where we were and where they were, the fastest way to them was to get on the turnpike and not on 95. And if you know anything about Florida, 95 is it's kind of like a Western. It's for the quick and the dead. And, um, and you drive 95 and there's no tolls, but there is a toll on the turnpike. But Kay and I, it's been years since we got on the turnpike, and so we stopped at a toll and we got a ticket. If you've been in Florida, you know what I'm talking about unless you have a sun pass. We got a ticket and we drove, uh, we got our parents and so forth, we got back on uh, and we got this ticket and then we drove all the way back to Fort Lauderdale and we got off and there, were, there was no booth. They'd taken all the booths off. And Kay said, I don't get it. I said, I don't get it either. 
But the second time we did it, I saw on my peripheral vision, there was a booth off to the side. Apparently, you go off the interstate, you pay this ticket, and you get back on. That ticket's on my dresser right now. I didn't see it. I didn't know it. I kind of I deduced all that, you know, after I... Actually, I'm just waiting on a letter from the Florida folks that run the turnpike. Um, hopefully, they got a picture of me driving, and, um, and I will have to pay some kind of fine. Um, I would call and say, hey, um, I did this, but it actually, um, there's kind of not a way you have to buy a sun pad. I don't, it's really convoluted. Really, I'm just waiting. I'm going to try for grace. That's what I'm hoping for. I'm going to try for grace. I told my mom that story this time. She goes, oh, Harold, it's okay. The fine's like $500. I said, no, it's not, Mom. It's not $500. I said, is it, Kay? You know. Oh, last time. Have you, and you get caught like that, right? You can't deny it. They, they photographed you. In Colorado, they don't, policemen don't even stop you anymore, Ben. They just take pictures of you running lights. And so I got a ticket in the mail a couple of years ago, and Shelly and I are actually leaning forward through the windshield, you can see, and we were so upset, not because of the ticket, the picture was so bad of us that w when I paid it, I said, please destroy this picture, you know. It, made, it, just, it added weight, a lot of weight. And, um, but we're caught, we're caught. See, what I'm saying is, we all think we're gonna get away and I do think there are people right now with social injustice and things like that, they're going, hey, we need to do something about this, and we do need to stand up. The Bible actually says that we need to, uh, we need to, to challenge these kinds of things. But guess what, y'all? In the end, no one is going to get away with anything. The court may decide one thing, and a court may decide another thing, but all of us. And it's interesting how we want justice for other people and mercy for us, but one day all of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we will answer not, you will not answer for me and I will not answer for you, you will only answer for you. But judgment, judgment is coming and I think it is a poignant reminder. Secondly, right up to the end, and if you read the parables, there's another parable of the wheat and the tares and right up until the end, there is good and bad together. A lot of people think, you know, toward the end, you know, everybody's going to be holding hands together and singing Kumbaya, and we're all going to get along. That's not the case. The Bible says that the wicked will be around with the righteous, and they will exist together. In fact, the story, the parable of the wheat and the tares, when they say, hey, we want to pull them up, the, the, the man in charge of all of this says, no, 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 leave them together, leave them, don't do anything. Because in the end, the, the tares and the wheats will be separated, and one will be gathered and the other will be burned. Leave them alone. It is a reminder that, uh, that this wickedness, which we certainly need to be light and salt to, that this wickedness that has invaded our world because of Satan will exist right up until the end. It will not go away. The thirdly, and I think this is an important one, and that is that God will do the judging you won't and I won't. He's the judge, not me and not you. And we are poor judges. This, by the way, does not mean we can't make judgments in our life. I love it when people say, do you believe in this? Do you believe in that? Well, don't, hey, you know, doesn't the Bible say not to judge? Don't judge me. Don't judge my lifestyle. Don't judge what, listen, y'all, when the Bible says, in fact, it's, it's in Matthew 7 and verse 1 and following, he's talking about uh, do not judge lest you be judged. Um, he also goes on to say, get the plank out of your eye before you get the speck out of someone else's. There is a sense in which you and I need to have some kind of discernment and have some kind of judgment in our life to know right from wrong, uh, black from white, um, the, the honorable from the unhonorable. If the Bible says, and it does, that good, bad company corrupts good morals, you have to know what bad company is and what good morals are. Is that not right? So you've got to make some kind of decision. But ultimately, in the end, over and over, the reminder is we're not going to judge. God is going to be the judge. You and I are terrible judge. Um, the, the, the story of the dragnet is all of these fish are pulled in 
and the angels under the master, did you notice that? Under the direction of the master will do the separating on the shore. The angels do the separating under the direction of the master of the wheat and the tares. On one hand, I think all of these stories emphasize uh, the point that the, the job of judgment is reserved ultimately for God. The sower, in the case of the sower, the sower is a person who spreads seed, not worrying about the soil. The wheat and the tares, the workers are encouraged to, hey, let the weeds grow. Just you keep doing the right thing. The story about fishing is, um, you know, fish, catch as many as you can. God is going to do the separating. It's almost like the New Testament is telling us, do the farming. And when you do the farming, you cast the seed. When you do the fishing, cast the net. Don't worry about whether they're wheat or weeds, or whether there's good fish, or bad fish, or good soil, or bad soil. Just do the job of sharing the gospel in a generous way, and don't get too caught up into judgment. Trust that in the end, God's going to work things out. I'm going to say it again. In the end, God will work things out. In the end, God will pass judgment. In the end, God will divide the wheat from the weeds, and the good fish from the bad. So under this, it brings me to say two things. First of all, we're not very good anyway. We're not very skilled at saying who's worthy of the kingdom and who's not because quite frankly, we don't know. We don't know the hearts of people. And we, um, we get caught up so many times in saying, hey, I'm not really sure this person is gonna be receptive to the gospel. And it's amazing that those that sometimes we deem likely to accept the grace of God do not. And sometimes those that we think have no interest in the things of God over time do amazing things in the kingdom of God. Don't write anyone off. I'll say that in a minute. But we don't know. We can't look at the hearts and the minds of people. You don't know how God can take a life and transform it and use it. Secondly, we're not very good at analyzing ourselves. Sometimes, and I've talked to so many people who have already written themselves off. Oh, no, I could never be a part of a church. I could never obey the gospel. There's no sense in me in being baptized. I'm just not that kind of person. I'm already so far down the road. God's not going to do anything to redeem me. You don't know that. You, can't, you don't not know the, the ability that God has to transform your life, much less the lives of someone else. Do not, not, not only write someone else off, but do not write yourself off. Did you hear the story of a girl named uh, Tashima Beecham? Tashima lived in Detroit. This is last year. She had s some medical things. She had some, some existing uh, kind of uh, problems in her life, but she was pronounced dead at her house. She was having respiratory problems and was pronounced dead. Uh, paramedics took her pulse three or four times they called a fire department doctor that worked with them. But later on at the funeral home, this girl came to. They detected a pulse and she was breathing. Back to the hospital she went. For eight weeks she was in the hospital before she passed away. Can you imagine that your daughter died and her parents were obviously very upset and people did not know she had a pulse but it was weak as weak as it was she had a pulse and she was slightly breathing and for a few more weeks they had her before she before she passed away we do that a lot with people we write them off and they don't have a pulse and yet god sees he sees that breath he sees that pulse he sees the potential. He sees what they can be. You know, it matters not so much what we do. We're doing it for the grace of God, uh, because of the grace of God. But y'all, we, we, it matters that we're covered by the blood of Jesus. On that day, on that incredible day, whether it's death or judgment, both are the same. On that day, it'll matter that we're covered by the blood of Jesus. It's not our righteousness, it's his righteousness that we, are, that we want in our life. And on that day, when they separate good from bad, it won't be good because we did good things, it'll be good because we have him as our savior and our master. God will take into account, certainly every sermon I've ever preached or every class I've ever taught, 
every person I've ever visited, every good thing you've ever done, but analyzing us by that is the wrong way. What matters is, are we a child of God? Are we washed in the blood of Jesus? Are we part of the family of God? So notorious was the Apostle Paul as Saul of Taurus that they wrote him off. In fact, uh, later on, after his conversion, Barnabas would become a buffer between Paul and the church. I want to read, to you. this is Acts chapter 9 in verse 26. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him. I guess I would be afraid of him. He's been putting them in jail. He's been killing them. They were afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. And Barnabas brought him to the apostles and described how Saul had seen the Lord and spoke to him on the road to Damascus and how Saul had spoken boldly in that city in the name of Jesus. And so Saul stayed with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem and speaking boldly in the name of our Lord. And then it brings me, of course, to the last thing. And that is, let's not write anyone off. Aren't you glad someone didn't write you off? What's well, crickets in here? Aren't you glad someone didn't write you off? Say yes, Harold. Yes. I'm glad someone didn't write me off. I'm so glad, you know, it's, it's so easy to do that. Well, they're not interested in real spiritual things. Oh, they got their own thing. They're doing their own thing. Don't write anybody off. Sow the seed, cast the net, trust God to transform a life. Jesus called us to be fishers of men. Don't write yourself off. Don't write anyone off. God looks, I think, at others. He looks at us, and he looks at us with grace, and he looks at us with love, and he still detects a pulse. Now, I want to end with an explanation of what he's talking about at the very end of this chapter. Jesus closes this section, and he asks the disciples, hey, do you understand what you're talking about? And they said, yes. And he said, okay, well, you're going to be like a homeowner then. If you have a version, uh, the version of the Bible called the message, it's interesting. In the message version of the Bible, what Jesus says is, it's going to be like you own a general store. And in owning this general store, you'll know every, where you can put your hands on everything. You, you, good, old things, new things, you can put your hands on all of it. Jesus calls his followers a scribe. He's not talking about a scribe like we would know back in this time, they are followers, they are learners, but now he says, you're a scribe, and a scribe has some, uh, some uh, responsibility in teaching. He says, now you're, because you know all of these things, you're learning all of these things, you are responsible for what you know. And the disciples wouldn't forget this, because now they are, they're not just renters, they're homeowners. They're not going to leave, they're going to repair it not going to move out and just leave trash behind. They're going to take care of it. They now own this. And because they own it, they're culpable. They're responsible because they know all of these things, the new and the old, and putting them together, there is a responsibility that they have to share it with other people. And he calls it a treasury. I love that, the old and the new treasury of these things. They're, they're in your hands, and we have a great treasure that we share with other people. One story and I'm done. We'll sing while Jesus whispers to you. I love that song. When I was at Bear Valley, we would go uh, on these campaigns and we would door knock. And if you've ever been, had that experience, maybe with a church or on a campaign, you knock on doors and uh, people answer the doors. It's this cold calling. Sales people used to do this all the time. Um, some religious groups still do it. Um, many of you hide in your house from them. And, and we, we knew people could see us coming down the road and they would hide uh, from us or they wouldn't open the door. And that was fine. We'd knock on the door and we'd invite them to have a Bible study. We'd invite them. We were having a campaign that week, so it meant there were preaching. There was some preaching going on that night. We would invite them to, to be a part of that. And we were in a team of people, and there was a, a young man uh, that was a part of that team that he could not pass Greek. Um, he was taking it over and over, and he was a good Bible student, he, but he had a really hard time with this class on Greek, and, and uh, Kay would help him and, uh, with his Greek, uh, like she helped me. 
And um, I said, hey, she's, she knows she, she's good at, at, at helping you, learning these kind of things. And during that campaign, uh, Clint, this young man, he knocked on the door of a guy, a very educated man, uh, who was an engineer. And um, Clint said, he was, he was just from the country, and he just had a way about him, you know, just you liked him immediately. And he said, hey, we're having a Bible study down here at the church, and we want you to be a part of it. And this engineer said, man, I don't, he goes, I'd like to study the Bible, but he goes, I don't, I don't really want to go to church at, at night. And he said, all right, I'll come over and study the Bible. I won't go to church either. I don't really want to go. <laughs> And so that's what they did. He went over that evening, and instead of coming to the service that we were having in the midweek service, he had a Bible study with a guy. And a guy liked him so much and liked studying the Bible so much that he invited him back, and he came the next day and the next day. And on the last day of that meeting, Clint baptized that engineer, and he was, uh, for I guess eight, ten weeks after that, was leading prayers and the, with his family, his wife was so happy and he died of a heart attack and we, we, we got word in chapel that, um, that he had died. And I can remember Clint, we would stand at the end and we would sing, soldiers of Christ arise. And I can remember old Clint just smiling, smiling, singing that song. And he was so happy that he was able to study with that guy. And before, because it's appointed unto man, wants to die and the, then the judgment, before he faced judgment, he was a child of God. And he said, I know I'm going to see him again one day. That is what matters. Keep sowing the seed. Keep casting the net. Don't write anybody off. Keep telling them the greatest news in all the world. You want to transform the world, transform it with the gospel of Christ. Jesus is the one that will make the difference. He will make the difference in my life and in your life. And in the end, he will be the one that we stand before in judgment. I hope that you've made that decision, the great decision to give your life to him, to be baptized into Christ and to raise to walk in newness of life. If you haven't, I pray that you'll take care of the most important thing today. And maybe you've already done that, but you're not living like a New Testament Christian. I beg you to come home. You know, I, I, he knows our hearts. He, he, he knows how stubborn we all are. Man, give your life to him. Surrender your life to him today. In the end, the only thing that matters is that you're covered by the blood of Jesus. Just like so long ago in the Old Testament, when God passed over them during the Passover, remember there was blood on the doorpost? Um, it'll be the blood that he's looking for, the blood in your life and the blood on my life, the blood of Jesus that comes by way of the death, burial, and the resurrection. Give your life to him. I love what John says in 1 John, that he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. That blood will never leave you, and it will wash those sins, continue to wash those sins away as you ask God to forgive you. I'll be here at the front. If we can help you in any way, you come while we stand and sing the song of encouragement. While we are praying for you, come, sinner, come. Now is the time to own him, come, sinner, come. Now is the time to know him, come, sinner, come. Are you too heavy laden? Come, sinner, come. Jesus will bear your burden. Come, sinner, come. Jesus will not deceive you. Come, sinner, come. Jesus can now redeem you. Come, sinner, come. Oh, hear his tender pleading. Come, sinner, come. Come and receive the 
blessing come, sinner come. While Jesus whispers to you, come, sinner come. While we are praying for you, come, sinner come. Please be seated. Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a lowly birth? Because he loved me so. He life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Why did he drink the bitter cup of sorrow, pain, and woe? Why on the cross be lifted up? Because he loved me so, he loved me so, he loved me so, he gave his precious life for me, for me. He loved me so Till Jesus comes I'll sing his praise And then to glory go And reign with him through endless days Because he loved me so precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Good morning, church family. You all have very beautiful voices this morning. It's very good to hear you sing. Um, so we, we set a time, uh, set this time aside to uh, remember Christ's death and, and what he has done for us. And one of the, the really interesting things when you, when, you, when you study and try to take some time to prepare um, one of these, uh, doing of the Lord's Supper, is, is understanding um, the hope and the comfort that, that Christ gave to us through his actions on the cross. And, you know, we, we, we do study about him in, in, in the, at the Lord's Supper and the, at the Last Supper, but also we can, we can learn about um, the hope that he is giving to us through some of his childhood stories. <clears throat> and I would like to read one of those um, today. I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 2. I'm going to be starting in verse 25. It says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. 
and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, the consolation of Israel there is, is a common word is Messiah, the comforter. It has been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in child, brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what, he, what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him into his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother marveled at what he was uh, saying to him or saying about him. And then Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. And there was also a prophetess, Anna, the, the daughter of Phanet, um, Phanuel of the tribe Asher. And she was very old. And she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she, a widow until she was 84. And she never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying, coming up to them, and at the very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. So let's now think about the comfort and the salvation that Christ has promised to us through his, his, uh, his death. Would you please pray with me? Father God, <clears throat> we thank you so much for all the blessings that you give us, Lord. We mostly thank you, Lord, for your son's death for the comfort that we have in knowing that when he came here on earth to to die for our sins that that one day he will stand with us on on judgment and and to say lord i know i know this person and uh, i have i have paid for their sins please god be with us now as we take this bread that represents your son's body in jesus name amen Would you please pray with me? Father God, again, we come to you um, in prayer, thanking you for the great sacrifice that you gave to us through your only son. Dear God, be with us now as we uh, partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents your son's blood that was, that was pierced for us, Lord, that, that uh, we may be washed in his blood for, this, uh, for the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. That now concludes the Lord's Supper. Um, also, we have uh, an opportunity to give um, back what uh, a, a very small portion of of what God has given us. He's uh, He's blessed us in many things, not monetarily, but uh, just just life, just given us life. He's you know we we can't possibly pay that back, but. But as we uh, now come to the portion where we give the offering, we just want to you know, give just back a small portion of what he's given to us. Let's pray, please. Father God, we thank you so much for all the many things that you've given us, Lord, and just, just everything that you've done for us. And we pray, God, now that as we uh, give back a small portion that uh, these funds may be used in the glory and furthering 
of your church here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, uh, we're grateful everyone's here this morning, especially thankful f uh, if you're visiting with us. Uh, we'd love to have a chance to get to meet you right after worship. If you can stick around for a few minutes, love to get to know you. Uh, grateful for those who are online with us this morning. Thank you for being with us. If you would, we'll stand together for our final song and prayer. And then if you would, be seated just for a few more minutes. Um, and Scott will have a few announcements for us. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me, it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can fill my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you one more time, giving you thanks for giving us one more day of life and blessing and protection. We pray, O oh Lord, that all what was said and done this morning was pleasing and accepted in your sight. And we pray, O oh Lord, also for the preacher who brought us the message this morning, the song leader, and each and every one of us that's present. We pray, O oh Lord, now that we are about to leave, not from your presence, but from the presence of each other, that you will continue protecting us and blessing us until the next appointed time. Thank you for all your blessing in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>